The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each week, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's right. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and have a bit of fun as we study the words of the awesome men and women that God has called to direct His Church in the latter days. I'm Meg Tilton. And I'm Melissa Fugaza. This episode, we're talking about Elder Gary E. Stevens' address in titled nourishing and bearing your testimony so meg and i were chatting just a little bit before i've actually never physically met meg this is our first episode together um but we're laughing because this is probably what our 12th attempt to record this (laughs) yes and i'm not even exaggerating gods the recording gods were like no not today so yes (laughs) we literally have been trying for two weeks to record this episode so I hope it was worth everyone's wait <laughs> when they when they hear this episode. Um, so, <laughs> oh my goodness, it was ridiculous. So I, <laughs> just to get right into it, so very long story short, um, I've mentioned it in the past couple of podcasts that I've done since the last general conference. My dad actually passed away the night before conference of last October, so I did not get to just sit and enjoy and watch conference like I normally do. And so I had to go back and watch it kind of over the course of, you know, a few months after that and go through and read it. Uh, But I loved this talk by Elder Stevenson. Um, And I actually, when I research for doing these podcast episodes, I do like to go back and actually watch it again. Um, I like picking up on the, their voice and kind of anyway, and I just, I love it. And, most recently in church and in our studies, if you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we follow this curriculum called Come Follow Me. And this year we're studying the New Testament, which is amazing. And I've realized and, and uh, kind of connected that testimony, feeding our testimonies, growing our testimonies, making sure our testimonies are strong, has really kind of been intertwined with our recent studies. Have you noticed that Meg? Yeah. I mean, I think that even our prophet, you know, that's like a huge push of his that he's really been like, you have to have your own testimony. And I, I was just released from seminary. I taught seminary up until February, but got released because I got a new calling. But um, I kept coming back to this, like the importance of like your testimony and, and, building your testimony and bearing your testimony and having that strength there. And where does that come from? And I think he really does a good job in this talk of how we do that, how we nourish it and how we make it stronger. So yeah, your testimony really is everything and you have to understand what it is exactly so that you can share it for one. Um, as I like the story that he shares at the beginning of this talk and, um, because, It really is true. They say like your testimony is strengthened in the bearing of it. And I think that that is true. And I think one thing that is really important for people to remember too, is that it doesn't have to be some grandiose testimony. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to have all these sensational stories. It can just be a very simple testimony. And that is so important just to make sure that you have that foundation. Yeah, I agree. And I did love this story. So to summarize, for those who didn't read it, it's about a young man who is at a student leader event. um, And it's, I guess, students all around the country. And he's from Utah. um, So it has like his name and then the state underneath. And so Utah obviously is is pretty well known for having lots of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day State Saints, not states, saints. Um, or AKA by the nickname Mormon. So of course he, you know, he's in this 
he's at this event and some of the students kind of ask him all these questions about like Joseph Smith and some things. And he's really awkward and embarrassed. But the thing I love so much about this is as he's talking to one of the young men who he can tell is kind of being a little bit mocking. Yeah. Another young man says to him after, Hey, actually, um, where can I get a copy of the book of Mormon? He was actually genuinely interested, but I loved after he's sharing these thoughts about the gospel with these kids that he said, I discovered I was proud of my religion. And I think that's what's so cool about testimonies and sharing your testimony. You yourself realize how precious and important it is to you when maybe you, you didn't before. I have, I know I've shared this story before, but if you're new to our podcast, here you go, you can hear it for the first time. Many, many years ago when I was in college, um, I had this friend and he and I shared a mutual love of a television show called X-Files. No, it's not a, it's not a religious show. (laughs) By any stretch of the imagination, it's a sci-fi, I don't know. If you don't know what X-Files is, Google it, you'll, you'll find out. Anyway, we were really into it. And of course, this is pre, you know, recorded era. So you had to be at home in front of the TV at the appointed hour to watch the show. So we found out we both liked it. And so every other week we would alternate going to each other's apartments and watch it together. And he was from a a really strong Baptist family. Um, And he and I never really talked religion. As a matter of fact, we were pretty new friends. We didn't know each other super well, but we had this mutual love of all things X-Files. So one night I remember we were sitting there watching an episode and I still remember it was about alien abduction. So just not a religious anything. And on a commercial break, he turns to me and he says, what do you think about God? And I was like, what? And I had never had, I had never really, I have grown up in the church. I was born and raised in the church, but I never really had this like experiences with non-members asking me questions about my faith really before. And so I was mm-hmm. like, uh, yeah, God's cool. I mean, here I am 18, you know, I'm sure it was very eloquent. <laughs> and he was like, tell me more about how you think God is. And I'm anyway, I was like, this is weird. Shouldn't we just be, you know, focusing on the show? And so it was very awkward for me. Right. But the next week it was again, we'd hit a commercial break and he'd ask me another question about religion and about you know, everything. And it was really awkward the first few times. And then by like the third or fourth conversation, I came to realize like I was loving this. And as a matter of fact, here's the funny part. I would actually study the gospel before I would come and watch X-Files with him because I figured he would (laughs) ask me questions and he needed to be ready. Anyway, long story short, it got to the point pretty early in because I, you know, again, 18 years old and I, I wasn't a scholar by any means. He started asking some pretty deep questions, and I was like, I don't really know how to answer those. Do you want to meet with our missionaries? And he was like, yeah. I mean, literally, it was that simple. It was, I really hadn't, you know, done much more than that. So he met with the missionaries, and he ended up getting baptized. And as far as I know, this was 24, 25 years ago, he's still active in the church. And so I laugh because we were watching X-Files, and that's how he you know, but I think about it sometimes. I think about what made him feel like he could ask me those questions, you know? And at the time I was a pretty good kid. I was living the gospel. I was, you know, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I was going to church. I was reading the scriptures off and on. (laughs) I think he could see the light of the gospel in me. And I think he felt comfortable in approaching me and asking me these questions. And that's what I loved about this story from Elder um, Stevenson's talk about this young man. I feel like he shared his testimony with kind of the skeptic and the skeptic just kind of walked off. But then I think since he was so bold and courageous and sharing the little that he did, the young man that asked him for the Book of Mormon felt really comfortable just asking him for that. And I think, I think as members of the church, we get a little, we just get really overwhelmed by missionary work. We get overwhelmed about sharing our thoughts and our feelings and things that are really precious and very sacred to us and personal. But I think if we're willing to take just that little leap and share the very little that we know, 
I think we'd be surprised at how much we do value and treasure of our own testimony, but also like what we can share with other people. Yeah, I think that that's a really great example. And I think what you're saying right at the end is something I've noticed. So you live in Tennessee. I live in Missouri. So we're in the Midwest South, right? And I think it's very religious. It's kind of like this Bible Belt area. And I have watched and noticed a lot of people who the evangelicals or Lutherans or Baptists or whatever, and they are not afraid to talk about Jesus and how Jesus plays a role in their life and how Jesus has saved them and how Jesus is such an integral and important part of who they are. And I think that we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints could take some, like could learn from them and could take their example and be bold like that. And I do agree, we kind of are a little bit more timid in how bold we are with our testimony sometimes. And I think that maybe your friend was like, he's was probably pretty bold with who he was as a Baptist, right? So he wasn't afraid to ask like, hey, how, what do you believe in God? And if we could have more conversations like that, maybe a lot of them, I guarantee, probably won't end in somebody taking the discussions, but maybe one will, you know? And if we can just say, yeah, this is who I am. And I think our leaders have done a really good job of like saying, you know, when you go to work on Monday and somebody asks you, what did you do? You just say, I went to church. I did this. I did that. And it's just like a normal part of who we are instead of this part that we kind of like segregate, like, oh, well, I only share that with my church friends. I don't want people to think I'm being this religious, crazy person, (laughs) you know? And if you just normally work it into who you are, people will respect that, I think, and ask questions. And I, you know, in high school, I grew up in New Jersey. So I I had, there was no LDS people in my high school, hardly at all. And I had several friends who would ask me questions. And at first I thought, oh, they don't really care, but they would ask some sincere questions. And at the end, they'd be like, you know what? That's really cool. I really like that. They did respect it, even as teenagers. You know, of course, I got teased. I got kind of harassed sometimes for my beliefs. But in the end, they all respected me for what I believed. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to be totally presumptuous and just say that most people, when they react like this young man did, like one of the skeptical kids or maybe some friends that you talked about when you were growing up that kind of seemed a little bit you know, kind of like joking about it, like, oh, whatever. I think it's more of just kind of like this defense mechanism of just, it's uncomfortable because they're feeling something when they hear it and they don't know what to do with that. And so I do, I love living in the South where um, my, like I, I, like I brought this up, you know, my dad passed away in October, but he had been unwell for a while before that. His banker, his like the, uh, the, one of the tellers or new accounts person or somebody he had kind of had a little friendship with him. And every time he went to the bank, the teller would be like, I'm praying for you, sir. You know, I'm praying for you. And I pray to God that you'll be healed or, you know, and I mean, how often does that happen? You know, you go to cash a check and the person's like, I'm praying for you. You know, like that's amazing. And you're right. As members of our faith, I don't know if we're just uncomfortable with sharing something so personal But we, I do, we really can take good notes from these religions, especially here in the South. I can only speak for our region where they are. They're so open and they're so, there's, they're not ashamed. They're not ashamed at all. And, and it's not that they're scholarly and no more. It's none of that. It's just, they're very confident in God and in Jesus Christ and what they can do to our lives and help us be better people. And they don't have any problem talking about that. And I think, yeah, I think we definitely can glean a lot from them. Yeah. So I love the next section in the talk where Elder Stevenson, I I love his talk because he has like these subtopics and so it's easy, (laughs) you know, okay, where are we at now? Okay. We're in this section. It's so nice. I'm a very organized person. So I guess I could be a little OCD, but whatever. Anyway, (laughs) it says, do I know and understand what a testimony is? Mm-hmm. This one, yeah. I was like, at first, I was like, well, duh, yeah, I do. Right. Um, but then I pondered and I reflected 
on a part that he says, acquiring this witness will change what you say and how you act. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, really? Do I really know and understand what my testimony is? Because what kind of a person am I? Am I um, paying attention to how I speak? Like what words I use? Am I being appropriate? Mm -hmm. Am I, and I had to like reflect a lot more about that. Like, do I, do I, am I like a walking example of Jesus Christ in my life? And I'd love to say that it was a glowing moment for me and I have nothing to fix in my life. (laughs) Um, That would be a big lie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What, What were your thoughts about that section? Um, yeah, I love that. I think that that's a great, um, insight. I like the line right before that, where it says it is, um, it is your belief or knowledge of truth given as a spiritual witness through the influence of the Holy ghost. He's saying what is how you understand what a testimony is. It's, it is this belief or knowledge of truth given through the witness of the Holy ghost. And, um, you know, just in conversations I've had with other people, I meet with a group of women once a week and we listen to Inklings by Emily Bell Freeman. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I love that. Yeah. Um, anyway, and we have these discussions and we were talking recently about the Holy Ghost. And I think a lot of times in the church, we kind of think we have a market on the Holy Ghost, like, cause we are given the gift of the Holy Ghost, but That's not true. Like everybody has the influence and can feel the Holy Ghost. And that's really how new converts to the church are able to gain their testimony is through the Holy Ghost. And, um, you know, we were having this discussion about like, how can people not believe that Christ is who he is? And I'm like, well, if you watch the chosen or you watch, read the old test, the new Testament or anything, I'm like, people were right in front of them. They, he saw, they saw him perform miracles and they still didn't believe because they didn't have that testimony through the Holy ghost given to them. Like that is the key. And I kind of had this epiphany because we have this, um, I don't know. I think it's the scripture. I don't even know where it is, but like when the savior comes again, it says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. Right. And I'm like, but not everybody's going to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But how will they know that? Because they will have the witness of the Holy Ghost bear witness to them that that is who he is. And so, again, going back to things that President Nelson has really ad- like admonished us to do is he's like, know how the spirit speaks to you. Yes. And I think this is one of the big reasons is because he's like, in order to survive in the latter days, you have to know that Jesus is a Christ and have that continual witness through the Holy Ghost. So you have to know what that feels like in for you so that you can know that Christ and have faith in that. And he goes on to talk a lot about faith in Jesus Christ and I, and how important that is. So, you know, yeah, the Holy ghost is key. I think to everything. I agree. And I like what you said where I, I totally agree that members of the church think they do have the market on the Holy ghost. And I just, that's so funny how you said that. Um, because I, it, as you were talking, it reminded me of a story. So the spirit it, obviously those who need the spirit, the spirit will touch them. It doesn't matter. You know, right. when you're baptized and confirmed as a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you receive the gift of the Holy ghost, but you still have to be faithful and worthy to have that influence in your life on a regular basis. Um, yeah. I used to work at a bank many years ago and we would have to have an FBI agent or someone come in and um, talk to us about, you know, all the fun things like robbery and fraud and counterfeiting, like what we should do and stuff. And I was fascinated because every single time we were trained, the very first thing they would say is before something would go down, like if you're about to be robbed or whatever, they're like, trust your gut, trust your gut instinct that something's, you know, if it just, if it just seems wrong, if it just feels wrong, trust your gut. That's where, and I sat there and I thought about that and I thought, you know, that is, that is the spirit. That is the spirit. The spirit is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling all the time. I have had definite moments where I have been praying for direction in my life or whatever. And I get kind of this like uneasy feeling Uh and I realize yeah, the spirit's saying, no, 
let's not do that. It's not a bad, horrible feeling. It's just that, you know, that unsettled feeling that you get. Um, Mm -hmm. People get that all the time. And I think um, we just kind of think it's intuitive or like we, I don't know where we think we get it from, but the spirit is the one that's telling us like there will be danger ahead or whatever. And the feeling of just calmness and peace that cannot be duplicated by the devil. It's only from the Lord. So when you feel those feelings, that is from Heavenly Father. And everyone has has the right to feel those. Um, and so I do. I think that's so cool that we need to be better about really, yeah, listening and knowing what the Spirit feels like yeah, and how he sounds or, you know, my for my personal experience, for those who are listening and want to know, I get thoughts in my head and I always know it's the spirit because I always joke because I'm not smart enough and they're really great thoughts, <laughs> like uh, ideas, you know, like that yeah. is a really great idea. Yeah, that wasn't me. That was a spirit. Most of the time, the voice, if, if there's a voice, it's like more of a feeling. Yeah. But I can identify the feeling. So like I know what it it's saying to me, if that makes sense. And then I also have very f- real feelings, like what I was saying earlier, if I don't feel right about something. I get kind of that unsettled feeling if I feel good about it. Sometimes I feel nothing. And I'm just like, the Lord's like, sure, yeah, go ahead, go try ahead. that. See, you know, it's not, you'll be fine. And <laughs> very rarely do I get like this amazing warm feeling of like, yes, do that. You know, mm-hmm. um, I have had it occasionally, but it's mm-hmm. usually after I've made a decision. Yeah. Um, Anyway, but I, I do, I love that. And I feel like we really do need to understand those feelings. And I, and every time we do have those moments, those experiences with the spirit, our testimony is growing, Uh which I like because the next subtopic is, do I know how to bear my testimony? And again, I read that and I was like, oh yeah, totally, whatever. And then again, I thought more, do I really know how to bear it? So what was your, do you have like any special favorite parts from that section? Well, I really like the line where he says, your testimony in Jesus Christ isn't just what you say, it's who you are. And I think, and I think that that, um, I think again, like, again, we can learn so much from what I was saying earlier, like, who are you? What are you creating with your life? Like, there are so many people out there that aren't members of our church that are creating great things, but in the church, we especially, because we know the role of the Holy Ghost, we have the gift of the Holy Ghost, and we know what a testimony is and what it should be and how Jesus Christ is. I think, you know, we think, oh, I have to, in order to have a testimony of Jesus Christ, I have to be able to say all these things and know all these things. But I'm like, really, you know something when you live it. And I think a lot of times when we um, talk about like knowing the Savior and having a testimony in him, we think that it comes with doing exactly what he did. But I think it really comes more down to being who he was. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to raise anybody from the dead. Most likely. I'm just going to put it out there, but that's probably never going to happen. For I mean, me, right? I'll be the first one to be like, that's amazing, Meg. That's amazing. <laughs> I would be amazed too. But, um, but like, how can I approach almost every situation and try and approach it? Like, uh, you know, how do I approach a person that maybe I disagree with? How would the savior approach that conversation? Or how would the savior approach, um, you know, just a decision that he's trying to make in his life? How would the savior approach, um, you know, getting a new job or going and getting an education? Like, how would he make all of those decisions? It's more like trying to embody the qualities that he had instead and then apply them to your life individually instead of trying to do everything that he did if that makes sense i don't know it totally does yeah it totally does well i think it's funny i love words and i love like understanding the root definition of them and things like that and there is no there is um obviously being a disciple of christ the word disciple is literally that you emulate your master that you literally do what your master does. Um, my husband and my daughter, and actually all of us, we do um, martial arts. I don't do it nearly uh-huh. as often as they do, full disclosure. But <laughs> our instructors, we call them masters because they mm-hmm. have mastered what they're teaching us. And 
we literally in these classes are emulating the motions and the movements and the instruction that they're giving us. And that is how we become, you know, like them. So to be a Mm -hmm. disciple of Jesus Christ literally means that we should be doing what Jesus is doing. And I'm with you on the whole, I will most definitely not raise anyone from the dead either, probably not healing blind or any of that, but I sure can be charitable. I can love my neighbor. I can be kind. I can be forgiving. I can not judge people unrighteously. There are so many things that Jesus did and does that we literally being his disciple, we should emulate. And as we're emulating, we're learning to be that way. And we should be taking that upon ourselves and that becoming our nature. So I, I do, I love that too. Well, I think too, I think the important thing to remember is that that was Christ's mission right? He came to earth to save and to be the redeemer of mankind. And something that I have found so fascinating in the last couple of years as I've studied more about him is he declared that he is the savior and redeemer of the world before he has, he ever saved or redeemed anybody, right? Like he hadn't even performed the atonement yet. He hadn't even embodied that. Like he knew who he was. And I think to me, that's how you are like the savior. Like, you know who you are. You know why Heavenly Father sent you here. You know, you search out and des- and desire and pursue the purposes that God put you here on earth. That's how you're like the savior in many ways. Because I didn't come here to redeem people from their sins and to save them from, that's not my calling in life, but I do have one. And so it's, I become more like the savior when I fulfill that mission that Heavenly Father sent me here to earth to fulfill, just like he, the savior fulfilled his. And so I think that's such a, I don't know, from an eternal perspective, I'm like, man, if I acted like I am a, like, if I always embodied, I am a daughter of God, who's going to live in the celestial kingdom with my heavenly father, how much different, like, if I'm just like, I'm there, like I'm in the celestial kingdom, I'm living with heavenly father. That's I'm, it's already done. Good as done how differently would I live my life? You know, like he didn't have, he had already, he believed all those things. He knew he's like, this is as good as done. And I'm living from that future place already. And I think that that was, is just so fascinating to me and enlightening and just like a great teaching thing for us, you know, as individuals. Yeah. That's such a true principle because if, if you know who you are, there's just so much power to that. And I think an example of that that can be applied to all of us is if you if you've ever watched a movie or read a book, most of the time that main character is trying to figure out their origin story, right? Like who they are. And once they find that out, there's a new added power and ambition to them and this desire to fulfill and to fill those those expectations and ambitions, right? So that must be this innate thing that we have within each and every one of us being, I, I always heard this saying, God's an embryo. I don't know how I feel about that sometimes, but that's a great phrase because we literally are children of God. And when you're a child of God, that sets this, not a standard, I don't want to say that, but it kind of sets this, this whole image of this is your potential. This is where you could be. And even if you don't get to that point, you still are a child of God. So you have that capacity. It's like what you're saying that even before Christ actually physically was born on the earth and carried out his things, he was still the savior and redeemer of the world. That was his identity. That was his, that was who he is, was, is, right? I love that. I think that's really cool. And I think that that strengthens your testimony, right? Because when you know who you are and you know your purpose, it's so much easier Like he wasn't like when the savior, when like the Sadducees and Pharisees are like, are you serious? Are you really the savior of the world? He's not like, oh, let me go check. Yeah. Let me double check on that. (laughs) You know, like he's like, no, like this is who I am. And I think that he, in a way, because he had a human side to him, had to have faith as well. Like, I think he had to have faith in himself. Like we're commanded to have faith in Jesus Christ. Like that's the first principle of the gospel is faith in Jesus Christ. 
And I think that maybe there was a part of him that had to have faith in himself too. Like, no, like God has told me that this is who I am. This is my purpose. And I'm going to go forward. Even when people are telling me I'm not that person, even when people are, when people kill me for being that person, I am that person. Like, and he had to have a faith and testimony in himself. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to share a a little learning thing that I've learned and it's going to seem like I'm going off topic, but I'm really not. Okay. So, <laughs> cause I do that. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that today. Anyway. Um, recently. So personally I have had to really try to figure out prayer. It's such a basic concept, right? But prayer is just so complex for me. I've just, I don't know. Like, I guess my biggest thing is, well, God already knows. So like, why do I need to talk to him about it? Like, that's kind of been my attitude. So anyway, long story short, I've been praying to know more about prayer. And Mm -hmm. as I've been reading and studying the New Testament, as we've been going through these, come follow me, I I had this answer to my prayer a couple of days ago as I was reading about when Jesus was choosing his apostles. And I noticed as I read through these chapters that before anything, really, I'm sure before anything, but really before anything significant that Jesus did, he was praying. He would, and it depended on what it was, but like if he was getting ready to do like the Sermon on the Mount, which was a big, a big thing, right? Big multitude of people. He went up into the mountains and he dedicated time to praying. He was always communicating with Heavenly Father. He was always seeking to know the will of God. He was always probably seeking strength to, to do what he knew he needed to do. And that requires perfect faith. Um, but faith is an action word, right? So he would pray to Heavenly Father, and Heavenly Father, I'm sure, would give him direction. And Jesus, even Jesus himself, perfect, still needed the faith to move forward and do those things. Yeah. And I'm going to be maybe blasphemous, but I'm going to say, I don't know if, I know Jesus is perfect and he did everything Heavenly Father wanted him to do. But sometimes I wondered if he did something and was like, I don't know how this is going to shake out. I mean, I'm sure something, you know, I'm sure like the big things, like he knew he wasn't going to die before his time. He knew that's things, but, but really that's what faith is. And I can't see why Jesus being even perfect and everything, he was still mortal and he still was figuring things out too. If seriously, part of the time he's praying in the Lord, you know, he received instruction from heavenly father and he had such perfect faith. He moved forward and was like, it'll work out. I don't know how, but it'll work out. And I love that. And so coming back to that, it's made simultaneously, it's made me desire to be more like Christ, but also to truly admire and respect and, and revere his holiness and his divinity, because he, he literally did all these things and he wasn't, you know, he was able to have perfect faith and doing what he could. And he's ultimate testimony to heavenly father. Yeah. And I think that that kind of goes back to a lot of the stuff that I do in my coaching is I help people realize like there's different parts to you. Right. And mm-hmm. I kind of focus on emotions a lot. And so like there's the emotion of fear and there's the emotion of faith and there's the emotion of loneliness and the emotion of anger and, the, you know, all the emotions. And the way that I kind of view them is, is that they're all kind of separate entities of me. Right. And then there's my true self, like my spirit who heavenly father sent me here to earth. And then I have these emotions and things that are created by being a human, but I think they're also part of being godly because we were sent here to get a body to be like God. So I think God has all of these emotions as well. But I think what the savior shows us is, is that I think for so long in my life, I thought he's totally void of all of those emotions. And that's not true. They all exist, but he was in control of them. He was the master of them. He mastered them. (laughs) He mastered them, right? And that's what I'm trying to learn how to do in my life. Like to be more like him, that's what I really think it is. It's like I'm learning to master these emotions. And as I've gotten to know them better, this is going to kind of sound a little woo-woo, but like they're like kind of people within me, right? Like I look at them as like a person almost and like, I'll have conversations with them. And the thing that's so awesome is, is that they want my success as well. Like, but in their natural unmastered state, they're going to do what human bodies want to do. And like, 
what emotions want to do, you know, and it takes me being the master of them for them to feel like there's control, there's direction, I'm taking care of them and moving forward. And I think that that is one of the reasons that we can have a testimony in the Savior, right? Because he mastered all of his humanness because he knew who he was. And so he's like, I'm controlling all of that from this place of knowing who I am. Yeah. And, um, and that's really what gives us faith in him. Like, okay, if he could do it, I can do it. He showed me how to do it. I can follow that, you know? And I like what you said too, like whatever happens, it's going to be okay. Like it's all going to work out. Yeah, Yeah. it does. It's all good. If you're doing, if you're doing the best you can and you're, you know, you're doing the right thing, it's all good. Like there's no need to worry about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The last little part on that section of what is it called? Let me go. Do I know how to bear my testimony? I loved it. It says, we testify when we love, share, and invite even online. Your tweets, direct messages, and posts will take on a higher, holier purpose when you also use social media to show how the gospel of Jesus Christ shapes your life. So I have a personal example from this. So I want to, first, I want to put out a disclaimer here. People probably think I'm doing this to inspire other people, but really I'm trying to save all the quotes that I can without writing them down. So <laughs> in my scripture study every day, I, I, I study from different, I mean, I studied the scriptures, but I also have like different other sources that I kind of like to, to go to. Mm-hmm. And one of them that I use um, has quotes from general authorities, old prophets, things like that, that, that relate to what I'm studying. And so if there's a quote that I just love, And I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'll post it on my Facebook page. Um, And I have been doing it for a really long time, probably at least 10 years now, because they'll, you know, like, here's a memory Uh from eight years ago. And I'm like, oh, I love that quote. So (laughs) it's working great. It's like my online journal, right? But I was talking to some friends a few years ago. These are people I, I know personally, but not like super well. And they had friended me on Facebook. And I was kind of saying to them at that point in my life, that I was like, oh, I might get off of Facebook. I might just get off of social media because I'm just I'm kind of over it, you know, and I don't know how I feel about it. And they both were like, no, you can't. You can't. And I'm like, why can't I? And they said, because you post those quotes and they're just so great. Like I'll read them and I'm like, oh, like this is, it, it takes me to a place I need to be spiritually and like whatever. And they're like, you, you can't, they literally forbade me from quitting Facebook because of these quotes that I post. And again, like I said, total selfish reasons why I post them. Swear to you. But I, it made me think, I'm like, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea that other people, it meant that much to them. Right. So I decided, okay, well then I may as well make my uh, page public so that, Hey, I might as well, you know? And so I made my page public and now um, I'll get people like, I haven't gotten people commenting very much, but I will have people that I haven't talked to in many years that I do know, but it's been many years. They will like my quote. They will, you know, and so I'm like, wow, this is, this is getting out. This is getting out to people and it's making a big deal. And it's nothing that I'm doing. I'm literally copying and pasting a quote that I found that I love, but it's doing something to people that are reading it. They're they're feeling the spirit and it's inspiring them to maybe research further what the quote's about or whatever. Social media is, and ironically, I have a social media marketing certificate now, so I really can't get off of social media, but I, but I, I see social media, obviously there's good and bad to everything. Something can be used for good and for evil. Social media to me is the answer to our prayers for preaching the gospel to the entire world. And as overwhelming as that sounds, it's not my responsibility to preach to the whole world, but I can do my part by posting something. I post almost every day, but that's just because I find these awesome quotes. But share your testimony on Facebook. I am an extrovert. I am not afraid to talk, obviously. I'm babbling a lot on this episode. But I know I have lots of friends that, yeah, they're, they're shy. They don't you know, and it's precious and sacred to them. They don't know how to feel. Fine. Put it on Facebook. And even if people comment, you don't have to write back, but right. put it out there. Share, share what yeah. you know. And it does not have to be a big thing. 
Like it just doesn't. I've someone the other day just posted my neighbor who's not even not a member of our church, but she's a Christian. She wrote, God is good. I love him. He answers my prayers. I was like, awesome. That uplifted me. It reminded me it's true. You know, what she's saying is true. And so anyway, I'm babbling now, but I do. Social media is wonderful. Take a picture of when you go to the temple and just post it on Instagram, you know, or whatever. I just, I think we, we, we so easily can share. I find it funny. Okay. I am babbling now, but I do have to share this one thing. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a homeschooling mom, right? Okay. So every, every city I live in, I always try to join like the homeschooling moms of XYZ city, whatever, to kind of get uh-huh. the inside info <laughs> on like the discount right. places or whatever you can take your kids. And I'm blown away. I'm blown away by what people are willing to divulge about themselves on social media that I'm like, do we really? I can't tell you how many pictures I've seen of some kids rash or I don't know, something. And they're like, have you seen this before? Like, do you guys know what this is? And I'm like, and I'll get on there. I'll be like, go to a doctor. Like, <laughs> just why are we having, I don't need to see your kids rash, but so we share, we, we share, we share mm-hmm. way like overshare is a, is a term, right? So we share mm-hmm. lots of stuff. How much simpler would it be if we just shared a brief little feeling of how we feel about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ? If we can share about our little personal medical issues, I think we're okay to share something that simple. Yeah. I challenge everyone, or I shouldn't say challenge. I invite everyone to try that (laughs) on social media. That's a, that's a great invitation. So, um, when I went on my mission, I served a mission in Korea and, um, and I remember we flew through Portland, Oregon, and I remember sitting in the airport there and looking at this huge airplane that I was going to get on. And my dad was an, an, an airline pilot. So I was not, you know, <laughs> airplanes were not like something that was super new to me. But I remember looking there and having this distinct impression like this airplane was built so that I could go and do missionary work in Korea. Now, fast forward, that was like in the late 1990s, fast forward to 2001, we all know what happened with airplanes in the United States with 9-11 and the destruction and the utter, you know, awfulness that came from that day. And I think that the same is true for like their airplanes were built for a really good purpose and the Lord has used them for a really good purpose, but the adversary has used them for evil as well. The same is true with social media, right? There, we want to kind of shun social media because we're like, oh, there's so much evil, but it is such a great tool. Like you were saying to share the gospel. There was a talk that I don't know if you've read this talk by sister um, Sherry do that she gave at BYU Hawaii just recently as a devotional. Oh, was it the and, prophets can see around? Yes. I love yes. that talk. Such so a good, good talk. But she was talking about how at the time president Nelson was not the president of the church yet, but he was talking about how he was sitting on a missionary committee and he's like, I want a smart phone in every missionary's hands. I want it. And the committee was like, are you kidding me? Like it's going to cause all of these issues and all of these problems. And he was pretty persistent about it. And so they started giving these smartphones to missionaries. And she said, every concern that the committee had happened, (laughs) everyone, but she said, then in late to, you know, early 2020, the pandemic happened and they had just basically given every missionary a smartphone. And she said, then what happened? Missionary work continued because they were able to be on social media. They were able to spread the gospel. So I'm like, it's just a perfect example of like, you have to be willing to take the bad sometimes that comes with the good and focus more emphasis on the good of posting. Yeah. When you go to the temple, just snap a picture or post this great quote that you read and put uplifting stuff out on social media. And it can be a great tool to use to spread the gospel and build people's testimonies. It is. And I will tell you a trick about social media that I learned in my studies at school. So there are algorithms. I know we all know what that is being in our tech era. So if you seek out good on the internet, really on Google searches, anything, these algorithm algorithms, what they do is they seek out similar content right. and they start feeding it into your feeds. So what's right. so cool about seeking good on the internet 
is there are algorithms that will actually help, they'll actually feed you good if that's what you're constantly seeking. I very rarely, it still happens, but I very rarely get something on my feed that I'm like, ugh, it's, you know, inappropriate or whatever. If you stay too long on a thing, like to watch like a little short video or whatever, it will say, oh, she's interested in that content. And they'll try to send more stuff. If you're seeking good, you will receive good and you will start receiving all those things so it is there's opposition in all things there's good and there's bad end of story but if you are seeking good the good will find you literally Mm -hmm. in algorithms as well too so my husband was very impressed by the way that I knew that I learned that (laughs) um and that's a big deal because I'm impressed too (laughs) thanks he's a he's a computer guy and so like I told him that and he literally was like I didn't know that and I felt really good about myself for like a good couple of days that's good. coming from me who literally only like I don't know how to use anything on the computer I'm still weird with my email like searching for an email is really hard for me but I I taught him something yeah I was that's awesome too. all right so <laughs> okay so <laughs> moving right along I do want to talk about in the topic where it says how do I keep my testimony I think this is like uh-huh. the biggest part of this talk in the world that we're in now, um, I don't want to focus too much on this, but members of the church are leaving for many reasons. Um, mm-hmm. I know I have friends and family that have left the faith mm-hmm. for various reasons, but there is one thing that I have um, noticed with them, um, and that is they stopped doing the day-to-day things. Um, it was a gradual thing, but they stopped doing the day to day. And as my friend Jennifer wrote, she's been a, a guest on this podcast a few times. I love how she says it. You need to do the bread and butter things every day. And that is praying and reading your scriptures and going to church. And I've noticed that from personal experience from friends and loved ones that have left, that those things just kind of went by the wayside and then something comes along and they're mm-hmm. out. So mm-hmm. how do we how do we keep our testimonies? How do we keep doing that? And I love President Nelson. Um, So Elder Stevenson quotes President Nelson, feed your testimony truth. And I love how President Nelson in previous talks, essentially, he said it a few times, but the most recent talk, he said, you need to do the spiritual work. That's the bread and butter that my friend Jen Roach says the bread and butter it's getting up every day and saying your prayers and reading your scriptures. There are days that my prayer is like a bag of cats. People I'm being dead serious. I'll stay, I'll start praying. And then I'm like, I wonder if it's going to rain today. But, and then I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm praying. Okay. You know, like, but do it, still do it, still make the effort, do the best that you can with the bread and butter Mm -hmm. of, um, Mm -hmm. give your testimony. What else do you, what else did you like about that part? I really liked that quote that he quoted of President Nelson as too, Nelson too. And I like where he said, spend more time in the temple and in family history work. And recently I've just felt this like need to try and be at the temple. I haven't been perfect at it, but try and be at the temple once a week. And when I started, I was just like, I don't have time for this. Like I'm so busy, <laughs> you know? And by like the second time I had this distinct impression when I left, I don't have time not to do this. Yeah. Like it is so important to be in the temple and to really um, study and learn more about the, the covenants that you are making in the temple. And really when we were, you know how I said, we don't have the corner market on the Holy ghost. What we do have the corner market on is the covenants that yes. bind us to God and that bind us to um, family that bind us to the savior. That is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Yeah, is the covenants that we have. Like it all comes back to covenants. Like when I was teaching seminary, I'm like, your covenants, your covenants, you have to come back to your covenants. And in my new calling on the Relief Society present now, I'm driving that home with the, yeah. Bless the fire you, my the- friend. Bless you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm driving, I'm, that's one of my keys of my presidency, I think, is to drive the importance of covenants to the sisters in my ward. Like your covenants matter. That yeah. is where you have to come back to every time. And you have to have a testimony of those covenants and the, and the promises that God has given you. Yeah. Those 
it's such a it's such a what's the word i don't say oxymoron it's an irony really that or paradox that might be the better word i don't know y'all look it up pick the word you think i'm talking about um that in order to value something and see how it really helps us we really need to be doing it so I, I will full on bluntly confess that when my husband and I were first married, we lived in, we lived in Utah for a number of years, actually. And we lived like 15 minutes away from the temple. And I would find every excuse not to go. We'd be, you know, we'd go like the once a month or whatever, because I felt right. guilty. Like I really should make time for the temple <laughs> and we'd go. Um, but I had a really negative attitude about it. And And finally, I don't even know when this happened, but at some point, I think it was because we had actually moved where we were a little bit further away from a temple and it was more of an effort to go that I suddenly was like I need to be at the temple like I started valuing going and even though I didn't fully understand what was going on and I'm you know I was still trying to learn and things like that the desire started when I was making more of an effort and now my husband and I actually work in the temple we're both ordinance workers we work twice twice a month and I'm telling you I just, I don't know where we would be without it. It's to this point where it's like, you don't, like, I can't, I can't imagine my life without going to the temple. We take our daughter for baptisms. Like, it's just part of our life. And I think, you know, that's, it's just one of those things, you know, you, you, you're not super great at doing it. Well, start doing it and then you'll be good at it. And I know President Nelson says all the time, you don't feel like going to the temple, go to the temple. You don't feel like praying? <laughs> Say a prayer. You know, that's just the way it is, and it's it's stupid. Like, I think it's stupid to think of it that way, but that's really how we are. It's just our human nature. Is we? It's yeah. like me and exercise. I hate exercise. I have to exercise. Do I love exercise? Right. No, I still hate it. Yeah. I have so many friends that are like, "Oh yeah, but if you did this," I'm like, "No, I hate. <laughs> I just hate it, and I don't think that's going to go away." But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't exercise like I need to all die, you know, or whatever. So it's important. It's important for us to, to do these things. Come on, just get off your couch, say your prayers, read your scriptures, go to the temple people. Come on. And I have this friend, these friends that they're going through really hard times. And I know we all have hard times, but like right now, it's one of those moments in their life where like nothing is going right. I'm sure we've all had moments like yeah. that. And literally the only thing that is keeping their heads above the water is going to the temple. They go like every week, no matter what, they go every week. And she said, I literally feel like I am crawling on my hands and knees into the temple just to have the strength to walk out of the temple and tackle my life. And I can testify that when you do have moments like that, if you have been doing those little things and going to the temple, that you will have the strength to continue to go through all these hard, horrible, stupid things we have to go through in life. But if you're not doing those little things, something will come along and it will just decimate your faith. And it'll be so hard to pick up those pieces, right? If you can pick up those pieces. Um, So I do love that. So if I don't know if you have any other thoughts about that one part, but I do have something I wanted to share that's not in yeah. The talk per se. Yeah. But I love uh-huh. this. So speaking of missionary work and sharing the gospel, my husband, like I said, is, well, we all do martial arts, but he's like super intense with it and does it a lot. So he met this um, woman in his um, class. She's a fellow student. And again, we live here in the South and they got to talking about God, which I think is really cool. And she was sharing a, a book she had been reading. It's called, I think it's called Just Give Me Jesus by Anne Graham Watts. So yeah, that sounds good. So anyway, she um, was talking to him about this one particular part that she just loved. And she said, I need to give you this copy. So anyway, she printed off a cute little, little printout of it and Uh shared it with him. And then he shared it with me. And I love this. So I just want to share it super quick. It's very short. So it says, years ago, my mother was invited to a very prestigious dinner party in London, England. As she conversed, mother discovered that the older gentleman seated beside her was the former head of Scotland Yard. If you don't know what Scotland Yard is, it's a police, it's a police department in London. Fascinated, she respectfully began to probe him for anecdotes. As he opened up under her genuine interest, he revealed that the departments under his authority had included those for forgery and counterfeiting. 
When she surmised that he must have spent a lot of time studying counterfeit signatures, he corrected her. On the contrary, Mrs. Graham, I spent all of my time studying the genuine thing. That way, when I saw a counterfeit, I could immediately detect it. My mother's dinner partner had unwittingly touched on a very important principle. If you and I want to be able to detect counterfeit truth, we need to immerse ourselves in the real thing. We need to saturate ourselves in the truth of the word of God. Isn't that so good? Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And I can personally testify to that because, again, going back to my banking days, there was a company that had, it was like a drywall company or something, and they had um, several employees that would only come into our bank to cash their paychecks every week. So we'd uh-huh. see these checks often. We knew the owner of the company. We're very aware of, uh, anyway, I could I could tell one of his checks from a mile away. We just had them very often. One lovely afternoon, this gentleman came into the bank to cash one of these checks. And he handed it to me, and he was very friendly, chit-chatting with me, and I immediately knew that this was a counterfeit check because I had just, I knew what these checks looked like, and it did not look like this. And so I pretended, I was like, oh, I just need clearance for my manager, blah, 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 whatever. So I go in, and I'm like, in my manager's office, like, oh my gosh, this is a counterfeit check. So she double-checked it. I'm standing in her office, and she's like, I'm calling the police. I'm like, great. So I walk back over and I pretend like everything's great. I just need to go get some money in the in the vault or whatever. So I go and I I hide in the vault. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> brave, everyone. I'm so brave. And I hide in the vault until I hear the police come in and arrest this guy. So it's so true. I think in our time nowadays that we feel like when things come up in the church or whatever that are unsavory or questioning. Um, Sometimes we feel like we need to kind of delve into those to kind of better understand. But I love this story because this is the greatest part about faith and testimony and whatever about this story is you seek truth and the truth helps you detect what's false, not the other way around. And that I think, and I'm, I know I'm putting words in President Nelson's mouth, so that's dangerous, but that I think is why he is teaching us. He's telling us over and over again, we need to nourish our testimonies. We need to immerse ourselves in truth so that we can detect all the things that are going on right now, all the deceptions and all the falsehoods and all the things that are going on right now so that we know that those are not true and that we yeah. can stay strong in our testimonies. Yeah. And I I love that. That's a great story. And I think though, too, it goes back to what you were saying about the algorithm that when you know truth, when you start bearing witness and your testimony of truth, it will grow. Mm -hmm. Like it will build on itself. Right. And I think one of the great things that um, Elder Stevenson really focused on too, was like, you don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know some of the basics. And as you open your mouth and say those, more truth will come. And, um, you know, I think his biggest take home was just like, just don't be ashamed of your testimony and share it with people as much as you can. And people will be able to see that. Like they will know and feel truth um, because we don't have the market on the Holy Ghost, but we can bear our testimony and that witness can be given to other people through the Holy Ghost and bring them to the Savior, which is really the goal for all of us is to bring everybody to Jesus Christ. I agree. And I love, it does say in here somewhere in the talk, but I can't find it right the second, but I do love how the best way to share our testimonies really is just by living it. Um, Because it really does, it's actions speak louder than words. There's so many sayings I could use right now in application to that. And it's true. Um, We don't have to be these eloquent missionaries or, you know, whatever. Um, I'm sure at the end of this life, when I can go back and watch the video of me um, sharing the gospel with my X-Files friend, (laughs) I'm probably going to cringe at how horrible of a job I did. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's going to be like, 
it's gonna be my face i know no one can see my face in a podcast but it's gonna be my face just be like uh i I don't know (laughs) like i knew i was 18 i didn't know what i was talking about but look what happened because the spirit fills in the gaps right but yeah i was i just happened to be living my life in a in a good way um not perfect good way and that's how it worked so yeah any other final thoughts parting shots if we were i don't think so i think along what you were just saying i think you'll actually be pleasantly surprised when you watch the video back because if you've ever like written anything or like said something and they're like that was totally terrible and then you go back like a couple years you're like oh that was actually better (laughs) yeah that's actually true and if the spirit held me that's true it probably is beautiful and i'll probably be like wow i was so profound i know i said that during a commercial break that's amazing (laughs) I don't know. It yeah. was weird. And I just love sharing that story because people would be like, you know, talking about what, what mission experience. I served a mission as well, too, like a proselyting uh-huh. mission. But I always love sharing yeah. that story because they're like, what? You know, I'm like, let me tell you. We talked about the gospel during X-Files. Like, what? <laughs> Well, everybody, thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discussed Elder Gary Stevenson's talk, Nourishing and Bearing Your Testimony. So if you enjoyed this episode, which I hope you did, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere you get podcasts. You can find links to all of our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org. ConferenceTalk.org is also where you will you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, find the resources we mentioned in the episodes, and learn more about us, your hosts. So if you want to follow me, just friend me on Facebook, because that's pretty much all I've got out there. <laughs> for all of her quotes. Yeah, for, for all, all my of quotes. Her quotes. Yeah, my quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to find me, Meg Tilton, you can find me on Instagram at Meg Tilton Coaching or on Facebook at Meg Tilton Coaching. But while we always appreciate new followers, it is better to follow the prophet and the apostles themselves. Yep. Although we speak about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions. So join us next week for some more personal opinions on Conference Talk Podcast. 